Hello! So, by the end of this video, you're going to know everything you need to know about how to use the Haunted PS1 render pipeline. So let's get started. So, what is the Haunted PS1 render pipeline? Well, my totally unique, um, unplagiarized description of it is a scriptable render pipeline for emulating PlayStation 1 style graphics on contemporary hardware. Or in simpler terms, beep 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 boop beep is about to get spooky. Before we go ahead, you need to make sure your project is in one of these four versions, either 2019.3, 2019.4 LTS, 2020.1 or 2020.2. It's verified and built for these versions, but it doesn't mean it necessarily won't work in other versions. Another important prerequisite is that you're not using the universal render pipeline or the high definition render pipeline. This is an alternative to those things, not an addition to them. If you are using one of those things, then you should start a new project using the 3D core template and then copy all of your assets over into that. So here we see the installation guide. Uh, I'll leave a link in the description if you just want to follow it along yourself there. The first thing we need to do is install git and git lfs because it won't work without that. So go to this link here and then select here. It's going to harm my computer. Yes, that's fine. Keep it. Okay. Click on it to install. Yes. Okay, now we go next. We'll make sure we have large file support included here in the components. That's very important. I'm gonna click next. And then we'll just select the use bundled open blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then just click install. Gonna do its thing for a while. Okay, and with all that, you're now gitted. Enjoy. Okay, before we start the next part, make sure you have Unity closed. Download the latest version of the Haunted PS1 render pipeline here. So just scroll down to the bottom and then click here on the zip. Once that's downloaded, we'll go show in folder. Okay, now we're just gonna unzip using our unzipper of choice. So I'm using 7-zip. Okay, next, find your project directory for the project you wanna have the Haunted PS1 stuff in and then drag that unzip folder into the packages folder. Here would be the time to make a project, obviously, if you haven't made one already. Next, we just open the project. So the next thing to do is go up here to Haunted PS1 and press this pipeline asset button to create a new pipeline asset and resources. And then we're gonna set that here in project settings under the graphics tab, set it to the PSX render pipeline asset. And now, as you can see, it's not all gray and we can actually... Okay, the next effect override we're going to look at is the cathode ray tube because the default is very um, obvious and it's probably the first thing you want to switch off or at least adjust a little bit. So press all to turn all of these overrides on and bear in mind these are overrides. They're not turning these things on and off. So ticking this just means that you're going to change the value that's already there. Uh, right now, we'll play with it a little bit. So... You can turn the bloom up and down, turn it up makes it kind of blurry, turning it down makes it more sharp. Um, you can change the kind of image that's overlaid here. So if I turn the scale up, you'll see the image pattern. Okay, aperture grill, compressed TV, VGA, VGA stretched, anything you like. You can even have custom textures in there. I'm gonna turn it right down for now. And I'm gonna turn the bloom up a little. It's kind of cool for emulating CRT kind of screens. Let's turn the image sharpness up a little bit and the scanline sharpness. Include bloom sharpness. Noise saturation is how colorful or, uh, sorry, noise intensity is how intense the noise is and then saturation is how colorful or uncolorful it is. The great mask intensity does what it says on the tin. And barrel distortion gives you this wibbly wobbly kind of TV screen effect. And the uh, Vignette it adds that kind of black outline. I'm gonna play with this now and just get an effect that's kind of nice for me. Well, that's kind of nice, but I'm gonna disable it for now so we can get a better understanding of what the other overrides are doing. Okay, so the next one we're gonna add is a precision volume. And this is one of my favorite little effect modules because there's so much you can do with it. For a start, we've got the geometry uh, precision. If I turn that down, you can see everything starts to get very wobbly. 
And right now the character isn't affected that much and that's because I've got an override on his material which is something I'm going to show you a bit later. Pushback, if you tick this, everything kind of gets pushed back away from the screen. For color, so this, if you turn it down, you're going to limit the amount of colors that you can kind of use in your scene or in the image I should say. And if you turn the chroma up and down, it kind of modulates that further. Uh, a lot of these settings kind of affect each other. So sometimes you might need one setting on for something to even have a visible effect. So bear that in mind. Uh, a fine texture warping. So this adds stretchiness to things closer to the camera is probably the best way to put it. See how the camera is kind of stretching the textures or the perspective is uh, even on this meaty thing. And if you turn it all the way down, then as you can see, everything remains consistent. Okay, I'm gonna turn that right up because it's cool. But bear in mind, if you have something that has very, very low kind of amount of uh, verts, or if it's just a plane or something with four, you're gonna get a lot of stretching. So in cases like that, you might wanna override that material and then turn it down a little bit so that it's not too extreme. Frame buffer dipper that enables dithering on the kind of colors and stuff. So you can see this pattern where the colors that aren't being precisely kind of uh, replicated have dithering between them to simulate shading. You can increase or decrease the dithering size. I personally freaking love dithering, so I always have it pretty high. Um, uh, you can also change the draw distance here and you can change it to be cylindrical or planar. So you'll see if I turn this down, everything is kind of away from the camera being culled in a cylindrical shape. Planar is in a more square kind of shape and the spherical is, well, I'm sure you can guess what a sphere is. So the next override we're gonna look at is the fog. So let's turn the fog override on. Select all. Uh, I usually set this to cylindrical or spherical. The blend mode is kind of how that fog is drawn over the other things in the scene. I kind of like additive myself, but play with whatever you want. I'm gonna set the color to white, get the nice kind of silent hilly effect, turn the distance down. And as you can see, it's very kind of smooth right now. It almost looks too smooth for a PlayStation 1-esque kind of game. So one way to get around this is by turning down the precision on the alpha. And if you turn it right down, you see it gets really kind of crappy looking in a good way. But if you turn it up kind of mid range, I think this looks pretty good. And then you can even kind of add or remove dithering between those layers there which is cool. Um, the the fall off curve is like how quickly you get into 100% fog, if that makes sense from the perspective of the camera. So if you have this at zero, it will be relatively smooth. Uh, and either way, just play with it and you'll understand better. You can also add a secondary layer of fog if you want, like red, because I love red. Turn the distance down a bit and you could have these kind of blending together. Uh, for now, I'm gonna turn off the secondary fog though. So the next important volume we're gonna add here in the overrides is the camera volume. So this is gonna let us achieve a lower res kind of image as well as some other handy little features like frame limiting. So let's press all. If I limit the frame rate here to 24, you'll see that now it's in 24 frames per second. I can put it to five. If I want to be really potato, yep, that's five frames per second, all right. So 24, I think, is quite nice for that cinematic kind of look. You maybe want to stick it to 60, or you might not want to limit it at all, depending on your use case. Okay, uh, this rasterization resolution is another important one. So if you turn this down, the lower the resolution on the screen, turn it up and it's like, yeah, smooth. You could use this for a door transition. I remember games doing that, like when you enter a room or something goes Okay, so the next volume we're gonna add is the lighting volume. So let's add that, tick it on. 
One thing important to note, although it's in the kind of pipeline for Haunted PS1, right now there isn't any dynamic shadow support. So you might have to make your own implementation of like shadows under the character's feet, for example, like a blob shadow or something, if you want something like that. Uh, but let's carry on. Let's tick lighting to be enabled. And you might think, well, this isn't dark. In fact, this is quite light. What kind of horror game is this? Well, I guess Silent Hill was kind of bright a lot of the time. Anyway, so go to lighting tab here. If you don't have it open, you can just go to panels, lighting. And what we're gonna do is go to environment and make sure our ambient color is set to dark, like I've already done here. Uh, Cause yours will probably be kind of gray bluish at the time. So the next thing to do is to turn down this dynamic lighting multiplier and the baked lighting multiplier. This basically sets the lighting to zero. So you can see how dark it can get. Um, if you turn down the fog slightly, it's gonna make it a bit darker. So set the fog to be more kind of gray. Turn up dynamic lighting a little bit to however much you want. Baked lighting too, if you want, but we're not using anything with baked lighting right now. So I'm just gonna set it to one and kind of just play with it until you get something you're comfortable with. Uh, you might notice the floor has all of these kind of triangle shapes and that's because it's using the lighting uh, to light up the vertices and it's not doing it per pixel. Um, on this wall, it's the same. Uh, basically like the higher resolution like that your model is, the more uh, faces it has, the smoother this will look. So it means that you can't generally make a square for the floor like you usually would. You have to find some way to subdivide it. The alternative to this is to select the material so here it's this wood floor. It really looks like a wood floor too. And then in the shading evaluation mode, turn it to per pixel and then it's much smoother. But as you can see, it loses a little bit of that PlayStation 1 kind of charm. So a lot of the time I will end up subdividing my meshes and doing it like this. One important thing to mention is that if you set all of the lights to real time, eventually you're gonna run into bugs where some lights aren't displaying. I think if you have over eight lights, then one of the others will switch off when as soon as you go to the ninth. So you need to start using baked lighting for environmental lights that don't move. Okay, so we're gonna add a light up here using game object light point light. And let's just put it somewhere like in the corner maybe. Okay, gonna set the color to something obvious like blue, turn up the intensity, okay. And I'm gonna lower the range a little bit. I'm gonna turn it from real time to baked. Now let's go to our lighting tab. And right now it kind of, uh, where's our lighting? Yeah, it's doing auto generate, but it's doing it on the CPU. So I'm gonna turn off auto generate, switch this to progressive, GPU because it will be faster and then I'm going to click generate. Now if that did nothing for you you need to make sure that when you look at these mesh renderers on your objects they need to have contribute to global illumination switched on. Okay if they don't then they won't be illuminated by baked lighting. Baked lighting has a whole host of kind of benefits, uh, not least of which is the fact that things will be a lot smoother running if you don't have to use dynamic lights for everything. But one drawback is that as you can see, the character and anything else that is moving won't be affected by the lighting because it doesn't have the baked data for it. So the way around this is to use light pro groups. Uh, it's kind of a tedious process to do, so I'll leave a link in the description for something to automate it, but we'll do it right now just to show you it working. So we're gonna go to game object, light, light probe group. Okay, and that gives us these kind of four little squares or four vertices of collecting light. And what it does, it just samples the light at those particular places. And we can just copy and paste like this and just make a kind of grid for now. And then what I'm gonna do is bake again. And that's gonna bake the lighting onto those light probe groups. 
Now, if I press play, you can see that he's being affected by the blue light. Okay, so the next volume we're gonna look at is the sky volume. This is a pretty basic one. It lets you change the background. So you can turn it to be the fog color or the background color, which is the background of a camera, I presume, but it's not working for me in this case, or to a sky box. I usually set it to the fog color. Okay, the next override volume is the compression volume, which I haven't actually used that much, but it's quite an interesting effect. It makes things look like they were compressed over YouTube or something. Uh, so turning the weight up and down obviously makes it less or more obvious. And the accuracy, okay, makes it less or more clear, which is kind of cool. I think it'd be good for like video cameras or like tapes that have been recorded, stuff like that. So the next override we're gonna add is this accumulation motion blur volume, which is one of my favorites. Uh, it looks just like something out of Metal Gear Solid 1. So if I turn up the weight here, you can see this, oh, I love it. There was a lot of this like when people were swinging around swords and whatnot in that game, I remember. Uh, Vignette, you can make it kind of appear only towards the outside or towards the inside, which is kind of cool too. I'm gonna set it to zero for now though. Dither, how much you dither it. Just dither everything, constant dither, nothing but dither. Zoom, I'm sure this has been used exactly in like uh, Metal Gear Solid 2. I, I, I just love this effect, it's so cool. Even more if it's just a little bit subtle. Yeah. You know, just like when, the, I just remember the, the Grey Fox cutting off Ocelot's arm, you know? Yeah. And last but not least, we have the Tone Mapper, which kind of is good for tweaking the overall look of the final image. So I'm not gonna sit here and explain all of these. I don't know what the half of these things are really doing behind the scenes, but just play with it and you'll find something interesting. Holy shit. Now that's cursed. Okay, so let's talk about materials and the material shaders now. So you have two shaders for the that you can use, which is the PSX Lit and the PSX Terrain. I'm just gonna use PSX Lit for now. Uh, render Q category, you can set it to be like an UI overlay, which means it'll get overlaid on top of everything. Background, which means it'll get pushed to the back or just the main one. You can change the texture filter mode. So if I change this, to something like this N64. It's a little bit more blurry. It's got some filtering on it, bit maps, or just the import settings. So whatever you like, I prefer it to look quite pixely. Uh, you can change this to be unlit. So if you're not using lighting, then the things will be unlit anyway. Um, you can turn off baked lighting, dynamic lighting affects, affecting this material. You can change it from per pixel to per vertex, which is what I showed you earlier. You can change from Lambert to wrap lighting. I personally don't see much of a difference between the two. Uh, surface type, you can make things transparent and you can set it to additive to make him like a spooky ghost or anything you like. Multiply, make him just multiply the colors behind him, subtractive. Uh, I'm gonna leave it as opaque for now. Now render face, you can render like the back only. Backwards man, the backwards man, the backwards man, the backwards man. I can walk backwards as fast as you can. I can walk backwards as fast as you can. I'm the backwards man, the backwards man. For textures that have some tra transparency to them, you can turn up and down this alpha clipping range. As you can see, like this. You can also add dithering to it. So it kind of dithers between uh, that stuff instead of using the alpha, which is nice. You can also override the affine texture warping, the fog weight, how much fog affects this thing. You can override the precision volume. So you can have a character walking around as just a bunch of triangles if you want. Well, a less amount of triangles, I suppose. Uh, you can override the color precision to make him just look very weird. I think it'd be cool to have enemies that's just rendered like this. Reminds me of Stan from Monkey Island. You know what I mean. Uh, you can also animate surfaces like this. Probably not so good to look on the character, but for example, if I did it to this body bag, it might look kind of cool. 
you can turn down the velocity to make it kind of less fast. You can also have like pan synth where it goes one way and comes back the other way or flipbook where it kind of just flicks through the texture like that, which is kind of cool too. So I also created this Danny PSX material effects package, which you can just download and drag into the assets folder, 100% free, uh, donate to my, um, so what we do after we've copied that is here, we've got this material property phaser, add it to any object with a mesh renderer. Okay. And I'm going to show you the first one, geometry position. Um, now make sure that you've got the appropriate uh, property selected and for the geometry position, it works best for multiply and just set it to like one by default or zero maybe. And then we're going to make a curve for it. So we'll start with this curve and then just do this, make it a bit scrumpulous, whatever. And I'm going to ping pong it on this end, ping pong it on the other end and make a bit of a curve here, twisty here, shambogla here, and then let's have a play and see what happens. We'll set it speed to about one. And as you can see, we've got this almost beating heart effect now, which I love. And if we turn the speed down further, we'll get that effect even more uh, cool. Yeah, and you could kind of adjust the curves to make it a bit more erratic or whatever. Okay, uh, so there's also, and I'm just gonna copy this component so that I don't lose it when I exit Pele mode, paste values. You can also override things like the color precision. So let's have a look at how that looks. Oh, we should make sure that color override is set to multiply as well. And there you can see it's also being kind of messed with, which is kind of cool. I also made this lens flare effect that you can use for the Haunted PS1 render pipeline. Uh, the setup guide is all here. Uh, I'm not actually going to go through the whole thing for this because the setup is quite straightforward. So I just want to end the video with some footage from my game, which is out in a couple of days, Lake Haven Chrysalis, which I've been working on with a friend with lots of help from many other people too. And you can have a look at the effects in action there. Thank you for watching and have a great day. Thank mm -hmm. you.